So what I'm going to do first of all is to, uh, during this hour, is to convince you that we found a niche which is cost-effectively worth following. And the title I gave is The Control of Neglected Tropical Diseases in Africa. However, I have to admit that I am a little bit stupid. And the first thing I did was call SCI with a name that nobody can spell, nobody can pronounce, and nobody has a clue what it is. And it's been a millstone around my neck for uh, 15 years. However, Schistosomiasis is a disease which is well worth treating, as I will hope to demonstrate to you. And although we've got the worst name, we are the best buy in public health, and I hope to convince you of that. So what do we do very simply is that uh, I never treat anybody, except maybe the first person in any one country. We help African ministries of health to deliver cost-effective interventions to improve the health of millions and millions of children and adults and the cost per treatment today for the reasons again I'm going to demonstrate is just 30 pence per person per year. So if any of you have got a million pound check in your pocket we could treat three million children for that. It's pretty good value. So question one billion people worldwide, which is one in six of the human population, live on less than a pound a day. Not many of them in this room, I'm sure, and certainly in the UK even. And why is this? It's because they are incredibly poor, and because they're poor, they are susceptible to parasitic infections. And because they've got parasitic infections, they are poor. It's a horrible cycle. We're talking about parasites here, and the parasitic burden, particularly in Africa, but in fact globally in the uh, developing world, is huge. But it's also unnecessary because many of the diseases I'm going to touch on, actually we have a drug uh, for one or other of them, and if we can just deliver that drug once a year, there would be no reason why any of these people should suffer the serious consequences of these diseases. The problem is that the people who need the drug don't have any money to buy them. And the ministries of health in Africa don't have any money either to treat the huge numbers of people who need treating, even though the cost is only 30 pence per person. So the neglected tropical diseases the phrase was only coined 10 years ago. Prior to 10 years ago, malaria was a neglected tropical disease. HIV was and TB was, but they are no longer because of the Global Fund and other very large donors. So I've divided here the neglected tropical diseases and this is the first page into protozoan infections, bacterial infections, and helminth infections, and then into infections with black type and with red type. Because I've only got 45 minutes, and I can talk for four hours if you could stay that long, but then I wouldn't get home in time, I'm only going to concentrate on the diseases in red. And in fact, I'm going to just concentrate on the top four, ascariasis, hookworm, trichuriasis, and schistosomiasis. Those four are all worms. And although we have the name schistosomiasis, we actually aim to not only treat schistosomiasis, which is a worm, but also the three other worms that I mentioned, which are somewhat different, but nevertheless are still helminths or worms. And currently, we're treating 50 million children every year in Africa, although it has gone up and up and up uh, as we've expanded in the last few years. And we're treating over 60 million children uh, against the intestinal worms, uh, particularly because of the vast progress we've made in Ethiopia. So I'm going to start just by telling you a little bit about the worms, about the life cycle, if I may, and about the uh, damage that they do and the burden of disease. The numbers are huge. Ascariasis, which is called roundworm, 
Over 800 million people are infected in the world. Another intestinal worm is whipworm or trichuriasis, which infects more than 600 million. And hookworm, which causes the most awful anemia, infects nearly 600 million. And that's globally. So just to demonstrate, there's a little girl in this picture and she has a very heavy dose of Ascaris or roundworm. And when I started SCI, we were buying drugs. And I was able to buy albendazole from a generic Indian manufacturer for just two cents or one penny per pill. And if we were to give, which we did, this little girl one penny's worth of drug, these are the worms that came out of her tummy. As you could imagine, she's a sick child, and yet we could treat her for just one penny. And as a result of that treatment, the worms, which are eating any food that she gets, have been ejected from her stomach. So obviously, one of the first consequences of uh, a heavy infection with intestinal worms is malnutrition, which leads to stunting. And if kids are stunted and hungry and have malnutrition, they're not going to be able to walk the various distances they have to to get to school. And even if they do get there, they'll be half asleep, they won't be fit, and they're unlikely to get a good education. And yet, as this graph shows, if we can get, and we have to be proactive because they're never going to ask for the drugs and their parents are never going to ask for the drugs because they don't have any money to buy them anyway. If we can be proactive and get treatment to these children, preferably even before they go to school, then within three to five months, they will have a huge growth spurt, their appetite will improve, and they'll join the normal growth curve. We've just completed mapping of sub-Saharan Africa. And the countries in red have over 50% of school-age children infected. As you can see, the number of people who need treatment in Africa is almost everybody of school age. So we have two miracle drugs. Albendazole, which I've already mentioned, and Mubendazole, which is obviously from the name related. These drugs are now donated. Albendazole is manufactured by GSK and Mubendazole by Johnson & Johnson. And between them, they have given 600 million tablets a year, starting from last year, so that children can be dewormed. And of course, it's free of charge. Let's switch to schistosomiasis. Uh, I'm not quite sure how many of you have even heard of it. How many have heard of schistosomiasis? Quite a few. Wow, that's great. How many of you know the life cycle and what it is? The odd one, good, or two. Well, schistosomiasis is a, is, it's a tremor toad or a fluke. This means that there are male and female worms, and you can see in this picture the big strong male and the rather pathetic uh, thin one is the female, and they live together. They actually are endemic in all tropical countries, and they cannot survive without freshwater snails, which are the intermediate hosts. And of course, they infect the poorest of the poor. And here's the map which has just been completed again by the World Health Organization, which shows how endemic schistosomiasis is in sub-Saharan Africa. And in fact, almost 25% of the population of sub-Saharan Africa are infected with these worms. The worms live in the human body and they live in the blood vessels. There are two species of worms, and one species lives in the blood vessels around the bladder, and the other one in the blood vessels around the intestine. The eggs on the left are slightly different from the eggs on the right, and that's virtually the only difference between the two species of worms, if you were actually to look at them. 
And as you can see, those eggs have nasty spines on them. And this is how they escape from the human body. They're laid in the blood vessels. They're washed with the blood flow. They rotate and rather like a tin opener, they burst open the capillary tubes. And the eggs on the left get into the intestine and are passed out in the feces. And the eggs on the right get into the bladder and are passed out in the urine. The problem is it's a pretty chancy effort to get out and many eggs don't get out. If they don't, the eggs on the left are swept to the liver where they die and are recognized by the human immune system which encapsulates them and forms a small scar. And as the adult worms live for 20 years, over the years the liver comes completely blocked and fibrotic. The eggs on the right get trapped in the bladder wall and can cause fibrosis of the bladder, they can uh, get into the kidneys, and they can get into the uh, female genital system as well. And bladder cancer at the age of 35 to 40 used to be a very, very common uh, consequence of schistosomiasis. So there's a life cycle. If any of you were infected with schistosomiasis, no matter how friendly and intimate you are with the person next to you, you can't infect them. It has to be a life cycle from worm to egg, egg reach, leaving the human body and hitting fresh water. The eggs then hatch and attack a freshwater snail. They then take over completely the snail's body and a month later the larva, which is on the left hand side, swims from the snail and that larva can actually penetrate unbroken skin for anybody who happens to be in it. So children playing in sub-Saharan Africa, in ponds and in lakes, in dams, females who go down to the river to wash their clothes or their domestic uh, utensils, people who do irrigation, people who are fishermen, are all likely to be infected. And we've actually just about covered everybody and every occupation. So what sort of numbers? I mentioned 25%. This is the top 10 or 12 countries and the number of people that the World Health Organization has estimated are in need of treatment. And they can't just be treat, treated once because the problem is that unless they have fresh water uh, and sanitation, they're going to continue to get infected and they need to be treated on an annual basis. This is particularly uh, true of young children. So what are the health consequences? Let's work through it. They start off, not surprisingly, when you uh, realize that the, uh, the uh, um, blood vessels are being ruptured with blood in the urine. Blood in the stool is less obvious, but it still exists. And that'll lead to malnutrition and anemia, the malnutrition mostly from the intestinal worms, which leads again to growth retardation and poor performance at school. And then, of course, because you've got those infections, you're susceptible to other infections too. And as time goes by, you get worse and worse if you're not treated, and you have the life-threatening consequences of bladder cancer, liver cancer, portal hypertension, and hematemesis, which means basically that the high blood pressure leads to blood vessels bursting and people open their mouths and bleed to death. And yet poor old schistosomiasis doesn't get the credit for all the deaths it causes because these deaths take place 15 or 20 years after the people are infected. So a man sitting at his desk or fishing and opening his mouth and bleeding to death it's very difficult for people to relate that to the fact that he was swimming and uh, bathing in water at the age of 8, 9 and 10 years old. This is a picture I, I took in Niger and there were three of the children in the school but every single child in the school produced urine like that. So there's no way that they can be healthy because they had never been treated. In Uganda where the intestinal form of schistosomiasis is much more prevalent. This is uh, an individual who's probably in his early 20s 
and um, his liver is completely swollen and he's got a very short time to live. So now we've got miracle drug number three, which is called praziquantel. Praziquantel is the uh, only drug which will treat and kill adult schistosomes. It was first discovered in about uh, the 19, uh, 1970s and tested by the World Health Organization in a number of different countries. Prior to that, there had been treatments, but they were not very effective. They uh, weren't pills. Uh, there were injections which had to be given over a number of days, and they weren't particularly effective. But this praziquantel turned out to be. And the company that uh, discovered it, I could imagine rubbing their hands together at the idea of $4 for an adult dose and 250 million people needing treatment. But unfortunately, of course, they very soon realized that no one was buying the drug because nobody could afford it. Fortunately, the South Koreans for once came up uh, trumps. And uh, in the 1990s, um, the owner of Shimpong, which is a pharmaceutical company in South Korea, visited Africa. And he, for some reason, decided that he would solve the Praziquantel ta uh, tablet problem. And he um, developed a new synthesis method. And by 1998, Praziquantel was selling for about 15 cents a tablet. When I started SCI, there was very little Praziquantel being purchased, but we increased the market size to the extent that the price went down to as low as seven cents. Today, if you want to buy Praziquantel, there's a range of prices. If you can buy it from the factory gate, it's up to about 12 cents. But if any of you happen to get schistosomiasis, and went to your doctor in England, and he wrote you a prescription, if you went to a chemist, you would have to pay £40 pounds, uh, for a, a dose of praziquantel, because it's an orphan disease in this country. However, in the year 2007, Merck, which is a German company, a pharmaceutical company, responded to urgings from the World Health Organization to donate some praziquantel. And they very generously said they would give 20 million tablets a year, which sounds great, except that it needs two and a half tablets to treat a child, so there's only enough to treat eight million kids out of the more than 100 million children and 200 million people who needed treatment. So a little bit more pressure was put on them, and they agreed to increase their donation, which they did, and this year, for the first time, they've reached the capacity and they're donating 250 million tablets, which is enough to treat 100 million children. That's put us in a bit of a problem because up until now, we've only ever treated 50 million in any one year. So we're going to have to ramp up our collaboration with the African governments and advocate for them to be more proactive so that we can reach the 100 million children in sub-Saharan Africa who actually need treatment. It's supposed to be given by weight. It's supposed to be 15 milligram per kilogram. Now looking around, most of you look pretty slim and you're not probably worried about your weight, but when you reach my age, uh, you have to be very careful. So I weigh myself every day on the scale you know, shave first to give myself every advantage. Stand on the scale, 83 kilos. Oh, shit. So I sort of lean forward a little bit and back on the heels, and I can often get that scale down to 78 kilos. In other words, the scale isn't that accurate, even on a bedroom floor. You use those scales in sub-Saharan Africa on a sandy floor, and anyone can weigh anything from 3 to 43 kilograms. So what we've done very cleverly, I think, is that we've taken your standard child and we've correlated height with weight and we've got a height pole now which is marked off in pills so instead of saying oh you're two meters high we say you're three pills high and there's a little guy here with a, p a packet of pills and he gives the three pills child swallows it and away we go and we only have to do that once a year we've learned though very recently that young children 
we thought really most of the people who were getting infected were getting infected when they were kids and they were coming out of school and playing in the water. But then a little bit of uh, social studies showed us that women always take their very young children down to the river when they're doing their washing. And what do they do to keep them quiet? They sit them in a bowl of water. And so the larvae which can go through unbroken skin is infecting the, the tiny uh, children. The current praziquantel tablets are horrific to take. They're the size of a bullet and they taste horribly. So we can't really treat preschool age children. They would vomit if they bit the tablet. Well, they would only, be, uh, they would only need half a tablet anyway. Uh, so what we've uh, now started doing, we've got a consortium together who are developing a pediatric formulation and uh, it's going to taste better. Uh, I won't go into how that can be done, but I, you can tell, I'll tell you later if you want to know. And this should be available in a year's time. And if we can uh, get that, then we'll be able to treat all the young children who live on the banks of the African lakes, uh, Lake Malawi, Victoria, Albert and many others, and even on the banks of some of the major rivers, so that the children can be uh, protected. In the year 2000, not a single country in sub-Saharan Africa had a program to treat schistosomiasis or intestinal helminths. Nobody was being treated. But for the few of us who were keen to do so, the United Nations Millennium Development Goals gave us an opportunity to advocate to the various governments, both of the endemic countries and of the donor countries, to do something because these are the eight Millennium Development Goals which have subsequently been uh, superseded by the, um, uh, the new SDGs. But the first one was to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger and we were able to say how on earth can you hope to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger when every child is full of worms and schistosomiasis and therefore, even if they've only got a little bit of food, they're not going to benefit from it. They're going to be hungry. How are you going to achieve universal primary education if children at the age of six or seven who should be bursting with fitness because they've overcome the various childhood uh, or infant diseases, the only thing that will hit them between now and when they start being sexually active and get HIV are these parasitic diseases. And yet we can treat them for 30 pence per child per year. How are you going to reduce child mortality and improve maternal health when women have hookworm and schistosomiasis, which leads to anemia? And the biggest cause of a poor birth outcome is anemia. And so we were able to get out and get support from the likes of the Gates Foundation, the American government and the British government in particular. Treating school children is easy. What we do is no scientific wonderland. We are still in an age in Africa where children will do as they're told when teachers tell them what to do. And the teachers are very easy to be trained. The drugs, apart from being bad tasting, are very, very safe. And so the kids only have to be lined up once a year and they can be given a deworming albendazole and praziquantel all on the same day and then they don't need any more treatment for the next year. We have the proof that it's been successful and that's the program that was run in Egypt over a 15 year period where schistosomiasis which because Egypt didn't have malaria and other um, tropical African uh, diseases schistosomiasis was the most important parasitic disease and the government and the World Bank and the US government uh, invested in Egypt and schistosomiasis has been virtually eliminated. So with that evidence we were able to go to the Gates Foundation and say look at that map. The only place where there's any schistosomiasis program is in Brazil, in the Philippines, in China and in Egypt and they're hardly developing countries. They're being supported by the World Bank. What about these poor countries in sub-Saharan Africa? And so the Gates Foundation did give us support and we started in six countries, 
three in West Africa, three in East Africa, with the amount of money that we were able to squeeze out of Bill Gates. We also had another donor that gave us money for Burundi and Rwanda. So we were very comfortable uh, for the first five years of SCI. Wow, we're working in six countries in Africa. And then we put them on the map and realized how much of Africa we weren't working in. And so we had to uh, try and go forward. And the evidence, as you could imagine, we started very slowly, uh, but by uh, 2006, we'd already treated over 40 million uh, kids. And then we managed to get the, uh, as I said, the British government involved, and they gave us money to add on another four countries, Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire, and Malawi and Mozambique. And today, thanks to uh, even more donors, uh, we're virtually covering the whole of Africa. And even those countries which don't look like they're getting any support are actually getting support from the American government. And there's an organization in America similar to SCI, uh, which is uh, using the American funding to cover the countries that we're not in. And of course, the large countries like Ethiopia, Nigeria, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, neither of us have enough money to do the whole country, and so we're working together. The World Health Organization have just come out uh, with the, uh, they have a weekly epidemiological review, and in September they, they looked at the neglected tropical diseases. Um, I hope you can read those figures, but basically uh, what these figures say are that the, this is the number of people uh, children and adults who need treating and as you can see it's a figure of about 200 million and this is the number of people that have been treated obviously we've concentrated on the school age children but 50 million out of 200 million is a relatively small percentage and now that we've got this donation of 100 million doses we're really going to have to move forward these are the figures of all the neglected tropical diseases. And as you can see there on the left-hand side, lymphatic filariasis and onchocerciasis, which I haven't touched on yet, um, are very well covered. And that's because the donation of the drugs needed for them started way, way back. The schistosomiasis and the soil-transmitted helminths are catching up slowly but surely. And... Uh, the hope is that in 2017, actually these figures are 2015, in 2016 and 2017 uh, we will get up towards 50% coverage. So now with some of the countries, the ones we started with, we're actually thinking, can we eliminate this disease? And in Uganda, uh, as you can see there, there's a patchwork kil uh, quilt of colours. In some areas, we can actually think of eliminating it because they don't have lakes and particularly large rivers. But in the uh, areas close to the lakes, we've still got to uh, continue treating. Ethiopia was the last country to actually commit to controlling schistosomiasis and intent intestinal helminths. But because they started from such a, a flat and low playing field, we've actually been able to make uh, great progress. This is the mapping that we did. We visited over 4,000 schools and took 30 kids from each school and tested them for schistosomiasis, which is prevalent in the brown areas, uh, if brown's a good description, brown reddish areas. And in those areas, we have to treat every year for the next five years. And we found that over 10 and a half million children need to be treated if we're going to uh, make progress. For intestinal helminths, I'm not even going to bother showing you that map because it's just completely red. There's over 30 million children in uh, Ethiopia who are infected with uh, those intestinal worms. So we started off only last year And in April last year, we did our first pilot study and treated 2.9 million school-aged children. At the end of the year, we did the next group, and we treated 6.4 million children. 
And this year, in 2016, we will cover the whole 10.5 million who need to be treated for schistosomiasis and add in 30 million for soil transmitted helminths, all at a cost of 30, 30 pence. But if you're treating 10 million children, you still need three million dollars or three million pounds to do that. And the um, deworming is not quite as expensive because uh, of the economies of scale. But still, we need quite a lot of money. The other interesting country that we've started working in this year is Madagascar. A population of 22 million, an island, and the prevalence of schistosomiasis, you wouldn't believe it. It's almost 90%. And so we've uh, started to cover there. But now the big problem is what we call uh, the elephants in Africa. I don't know whether you remember that table, but there's over 60 million people in Nigeria who need to be treated. And the Democratic Republic of the Congo has about 20 million. And it only has 800 kilometers of road in the whole country. And so the logistical problems there are massive. Where does our money come from? If we're going to treat 100 million children, we're going to need 30 million pounds in order to do so. Although we could probably do it for 20 million because of economy of scale. But at the moment, uh, and prior to 2006, there was no money from any bilateral donor. We persuaded the USAID in 2006 and they came up with this 100 million dollars over five years, which I can tell you we were totally thrilled about until we realized that they were giving 50 billion dollars for malaria and 50 billion dollars for HIV. But since then they have increased it and they've, we've probably between them and the British government got about a third of the money that we uh, really need going forward. There are very few other donors, uh, the Gates Foundation, the World Bank, there's a hedge fund owner here in the UK, uh, and he's found a foundation called the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, and he's investing quite a lot of money in Kenya and in India, e uh, Ethiopia and Nigeria, but concentrating only on children in school. The End Fund is a, a private philanthropy organization, which is picked on a niche market very cleverly, I think, and they go to the sportsmen in America who basically are of African descent and are making vast amounts of money playing basketball and football and um, American football and persuading them to give them money which they can invest back into Africa. And then there's uh, the guys in, in this room, the new wave of donors, the effective altruists. Huge, huge numbers of people of your age uh, who, are, who get together in the effective altruism uh, conferences that are held here, there and everywhere. I think the next one is actually in Oxford next month. And um, they have all committed to helping. They all want to make the world a better place. And they're looking out to find out how they can do that. And they turn to organizations like Giving What We Can, which is based in the UK, and Give Well, which is the American equivalent. The Life You Can Save, uh, which is founded by Peter Singer, who is, I guess, the grandfather of effective altruism. And um, Epic, which is another foundation which has just started raising money uh, for neglected tropical diseases and other charities. So these effective altruisms, people are spreading around. Most of them are very young, which means probably like yourselves, you don't have too much money to donate. Uh, but I'm investing in five years time when you all get out and start earning a lot of money. And then you'll think, oh, I must give that old guy some money to deworm kids in Africa. So SCI really is the best buy in public health, and I hope that I've shown you that. But still we need help. I may be the greatest orator in the world, but I can't pack a room like Bill Gates. So in 2012, he very kindly agreed to come to London, 
And up on that table is just a few of the celebrities and wealthy people and powerful people in the world, including the Director General of the, of the World Health Organization, the lady on the far left. The next person is the uh, Minister of uh, International Development for the UK. Uh, then also on that uh, table, there's the CEO of uh, GlaxoSmithKline and a couple of other um, pharmaceutical companies, uh, the top guy from USAID, and a couple of ministers of health from developing countries. And as a result of that meeting, there was a, a, a huge commitment. The Merck commitment to increase their praziquantel was one of them. The GSK increase to 600 million tablets of uh, albendazole was another. And what the Gates Foundation are funding is, okay, you've got the extra commitment, how are you getting on, are you doing it? And as you can see here, uh, red is bad. And the only, uh, the only disease which is lagging behind and is only treating 25 to 30% of the people who need treating is schistosomiasis. And the reason is that all the other diseases have had donated drugs since the year 2000, whereas our donated drug, praziquantel is only coming through this year. But hopefully we'll catch them up. And with SCI itself, these are the, uh, the blue bars are the money that we've got sort of in the bank, if you like, the guaranteed money from USAID, from the Gates Foundation, and from uh, the British government. And the red is what we could do if we can raise more money. We're going to have to raise more money because of the almost embarrassing situation that Merck have put us in by donating more praziquantel than we've ever delivered before. So where are we today? As you can see, with both schisto and intestinal helminths, we're a long way from the winning post. And the World Health Organization have actually said that we should be aiming for elimination by 2020. And what we say is we should be aiming for elimination by 2030, even if we're lucky. If we can deliver those drugs that we've been donated, we can get three quarters of the way there. But in actual fact, to get to the winning post, we're going to need uh, an increase in socioeconomic development in Africa. We're going to need an increase in clean water supplies, and we're going to need an increase in sanitation. With schistosomiasis in particular, unless we can get that cycle of pollution of water and people going in fresh water, uh, we will not eliminate schisto. And with soil transmitted helminths, until we get everybody to wash their hands after they've gone to the toilet and to wash their food before they eat it, we're not going to solve the problem of soil transmitted helminths. So SCI is a real value proposition, as I said, and the way we've had to do it and sell ourselves is actually to hire a health economist and a value for money person who will highlight, and this is a slide she came up with uh, in, um, for, for a presentation we were making recently, of the donated drugs, the existing infrastructure, even though in many countries the infrastructure is not very good, the education system is, the volunteers in each of the villages who deliver the safe drugs, and the fact that we can do mass drug administration. We don't have to actually prove that anyone's infected. We've got enough drug, and it's safe and effective that we can just deliver it uh, to everybody in an infected area. We are trying for elimination, both in Zanzibar and in Ethiopia, where we've got a new initiative. And that will be more than just the drugs. There'll be snail control, there will be health education, and hopefully in Ethiopia, we're going to combine with a couple of NGOs that put in water and sanitation so that we can actually find the uh, combined way forward. So we've actually got a great opportunity here. We've got leverage. We've got donated drugs, which are totally safe. We've got millions of children who are now going to school and therefore are accessible, and we only need to treat them once a year. But whether or not we'll ever eliminate schistosomiasis by 2020, certainly I believe not, and or even by 2030, 
But nevertheless, if we can get the drugs out to these children every year while they're at school, those horrible consequences of infection which I showed you earlier, we really will be able to avoid. I'd just like to mention, for those of you who are interested in global health, that one of the things i have uh, quite proud of and I've initiated in Imperial College is a one-week course on global health. It's not just the neglected tropical diseases. It covers HIV, it covers malaria, it covers um, war-torn areas, it covers the dangers of salt, diabetes, and a whole pile of other uh, interesting aspects of global health. Um, I've managed to persuade the college that we don't, want any, we don't need to make any money out of this. They did insist we charge something, and so we do charge something, but then we buy a lot of bottles of wine uh, with the money that we've raised because all the lecturers give their time free. It's only one week a year, I'm afraid. It's the last week of, uh, of June, if anybody's interested. Now, I'm looking at my watch, 818. What I'd like to do, if you're not too bored, is just show you a couple of slides about the other neglected tropical diseases in red. They are much more horrific uh, than schistosomiasis. They're really awful. Onchocerciasis causes river blindness. It's a life cycle, and it's transmitted by a fly. And it causes the most awful itching because the adult worms give birth to live larvae. And these larvae crawl underneath the skin, waiting to be picked up by a biting fly and cause awful itching. But in addition to that, they crawl across the retina and cause blindness. 60 years ago, 25% of all people over the age of 40 were blind. 25% of all the people over the age of 40 in West Africa on the banks of these big rivers were blind. And they were led around by little children who then couldn't go to school because they were trapped looking after their older counterparts. Once we got the drug, and it's the next miracle drug, Mectizan. Mectizan was discovered back in the, uh, in the 1980s and it sterilizes the worms. So if you just give mectizan to everybody in the onchocerciasis endemic area once a year, there'll be no more itching, no more blindness. And as you can see from this photo, that attracted people to come for their annual dose. This is a map of the prevalence of, of onchocerciasis in 1974 in eight or nine countries in West Africa, and every black dot represents a village where over 60% of the people were infected. And this is the picture today. There's virtually no blindness. And the reason is, the first pharmaceutical company ever decided that they would never make any money out of mectizan from people. They were making it from selling it to horse owners in America to treat their horses against worms. So they would donate as much mectizan as needed to keep river blindness away from Africa. And they're still doing it today. In Latin America, where there used to be um, river blindness, it's almost completely gone. From Ecuador, Colombia, and actually last week, Guatemala was declared free of, uh, of onchocerciasis, and only Brazil and Venezuela have a few sites left. And interestingly, uh, the, the guy who developed and realized the potential of mectizan was given a Nobel Prize last year. First time a Nobel Prize had been given to anything as unimportant as a neglected tropical disease. The only sad thing is he's 85 years old and so he can't really uh, benefit quite as much as he might have done if they'd given him the Nobel Prize 20 years ago. And the other one is lymphatic filariasis, which is throughout the tropical world, in India, the Indian subcontinent, and in the Pacific Islands. And it causes the most horrific disability because the adult worm lives in the lymph glands and stops the flow of cleansing lymph, 
with the result that secondary infections lead to horrible, horrible disfigurement of the legs in both males and females. And again, we've got a miracle drug. Albendazole, which you've already heard of, Mectazan, which you've already heard of, and if they are given together, they will sterilize the lymphatic filariasis worms. And this is a, a slide which I'm amazed that a, a company as good as GSK could produce because it's too complicated and too busy. But basically it says across the top that we give away albendazole to treat lymphatic filariasis and we give away albendazole to deworm children. Last year, throughout the world, 979 million people were given one or other of those four miracle drugs, free of charge to control either schistosomiasis, intestinal helminths, lymphatic filariasis, or onchocerciasis. Both lymphatic filariasis and onchocerciasis are getting close to elimination. We have already stopped treating for lymphatic filariasis in the Gambia and Malawi, Burkina Faso, Niger, and Mali, and others are on the list. And against onchocerciasis, river blindness is now no longer being treated for in Niger, Senegal, and Malawi, and Burundi, Chad, and Mali. So we really are making progress. This is a fantastic, um, a fantastic story. The other thing is that because it's the adult worms with lymphatic filariasis that cause the problem, we've still got the morbidity. And it's been found that if using soap and water, these legs will actually stop the secondary infection, the soap and water will, and people will get better. Unfortunately, those of you who are squeamish, for men it's not so nice. And the, uh, the worms can cause what's called a hydrocele, which is this horrific swelling of the, uh, of the scrotum. Now this can be operated on, relatively easy, $100, drain the fluid, and people can virtually get back to normal. I was lecturing in the United States, and I showed that picture, and a guy put his hand up. He says, do they have this in Niger? And I said, yes, they do. It's very bad in Niger. He said, I lived there for 10 years. I never saw anyone with a, with a scrotum like that. And I said, well, they don't exactly walk around the streets <laughs> flashy. And he said, I'll tell you what. I'll give you a quarter of a million dollars, go and, go and operate on 25,000 or 2,500 people. My maths isn't very good. And that's what we've been doing. We've been operating on six, we have a list of 800 men, and we're treating about six to 700 every year. And this particular gentleman is now back to normal. And as you can see, he's got a nice smile on his face too. His wife's just off the picture. She's got a smile on her face too. And then the other disease is trachoma, which is um, very easily prevented. Uh, it's a nasty, nasty disease. And we've got yet another miracle drug, Zithromax, which is donated by Pfizer. And with that drug, uh, they've now treated 444 million doses since the year 2000. And they've increased their uptake. And it's very possible that trachoma will be eliminated, uh, eliminated by 2020. So there we are, that's the success story of the year. SCI is part of it, uh, but not all of it. And the people in Africa, I think, uh, have a lot to be thankful for. So, thank you. Yes, with the white shirt. With all the sort of drugs that are being sort of flowed into the market, is there a problem with drug resistance that's arising? That's a very good question, and uh, one would expect that there would be, because there always has been. But the difference with schistosomiasis, you know, you get drug resistance to viruses and, and, and bacteria, but they're breeding like this. It takes two months from a female worm laying an egg to that going right round the life cycle and getting back to being an adult female again two months compared to milliseconds for viruses and bacteria are multiplying. And so the development of resistance is bound to be incredibly slow. In addition to that, we never treat everybody. 
much as we'd like to. And therefore, there's always in the environment some susceptible and some non-susceptible worms if uh, resistance was developing. In the laboratory, people have actually tried to develop a resistant schistosome, and they've really failed. They've found a few worms that perhaps were what you might call tolerant. They would need double the dose, whereas resistance means, you know, many times. And in fact, it turned out that even those worms turned out to be reproductively not very successful. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed and relatively confident that there will not be any, uh, there will not be any resistance to praziquantel. The intestinal worms is a different matter. In the veterinary field, resistance has developed because if a farmer's got 100 cows, he can actually dose every one of those 100 cows. So any worms that are left are all resistant, and then next year they can develop resistance. But even there, in humans, we don't treat everybody, and uh, we're relatively confident that if there is resistance developed, it will be slow. We're hoping we'll get rid of the worms before they become resistant. Yes, madam. It, oh, I, I perhaps uh, didn't emphasize that although we treat people in school, we make a huge effort to reach people who are not in school. We provide radio broadcasts, uh, health education, and we, ask, we tell the children in school there's going to be treatment next week, bring your siblings, bring your friends. And we reckon that we reach between 75 and 90 percent of school enrolled children and about 65 to 70 percent of non-enrolled. No, we, they are the ones who really need treating. That's a good point. Yes, one more question and then I know some people probably would like to go and if anybody would like to ask me a question, I, I, they can come up and see me privately. But yes, last question. Uh, it's a worry. Um, there, I guess there are two or three opportunities open to us. The first is to persuade Merck to give us some money as well as the drug. The second thing is to persuade, and this we're being relatively successful at, is to get more and more to get the countries to put in a budget line item. They can see how effective it is, they can see how in inexpensive it is, but still when you've got to treat, like with Ethiopia, they've got to treat 30 million kids a 10 million added to the budget of a poor country is, is not very good. And the third one is to raise money from companies which are very active in the uh, countries, like people who are drilling for oil and uh, other, other uh, pharmaceutical companies, to try and get them to, uh, to put money in, uh, particularly to treat their workers and their workers' families uh, the mining industry, that sort of thing. So between those three, and what we're also hoping is that uh, GiveWell have got uh, one or two very high net worth individuals on their board now, and so if we can persuade them uh, of our need, and what we're doing is we're presenting at the moment uh, a budget for what we really need, a budget for what we know that we could spend next year if they could give us a bit more, and even a true wish list and we'll see what they say. So givewell.org, watch this space. But we're hoping, uh, I, I don't think we'll, we'll treat 100 million next year, but what we will do is get the drugs in place so that hopefully we can do it the year after. Good, well thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for coming. Eight o'clock at night, or, that's quite late to be out listening to, uh, to a lecture that you're not gonna get examined on. Um, but it was lovely to see you, and, Honestly, if you have any more questions, those who want to go, you can leave and come and ask me if you'd like to. Thank you. Thank you.